Good afternoon. How are you doing? Awesome. Great. Thank you. Awesome. After lunch coma, hitting in. So here's a quick question. Who has ever seen me do a talk or a presentation? YouTube, no, nowhere. Great. So what happens is that every time before I do a talk or a workshop or whatever, I get the people to do <clears throat> some physical exercise. Now, you may be wondering, why is he doing this? You just ate, right? You know, we have to burn those calories. Uh, number two is because, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice already, um, is because you know that saying, fresh body, fresh mind, so I want you to be 100% concentrated on what's going to happen here. So, in light of this, <clears throat> I tried not to lose my voice, please stand up. And if you thought I'm joking, I'm not. It's, it's, going to be, it's going to be nice. So, what I need you to do is going to be very, very, very simple. All you need to do is lift up your arms like this. Okay? And clap. <laughs> and you may sit down. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so, what just happened? Standing ovation, right? This is how it's done. So what I do, I keep on sending these images to my boss and he's like, how do you do this on IT conferences? I'm like, no, just <laughs> give, give me a pay rise and I'll tell you. Okay, and the reason why I asked it because there are some people, like I did a, a meetup a, a second time in the same group and then when I said, oh, did someone see me talk before? And there were like five people already like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know what's coming. Anyway, progressive web apps is what we're going to talk about today. And my name is Tamás. I come from Hungary. I lived in the UK and a bazillion other places. I work as a developer evangelist at a company called Cloudinary. Uh, we're going to talk about Cloudinary a little bit as well. And quite recently, I was very, very thrilled that I got selected as a Google developer expert in web technologies. So that's quite a, a good thing. Um, also, if you believe that you would like to be a Google developer expert, then come talk to me and I can refer anyone. Um, so if you're interested in that, please come and talk to me. So quick poll before we get started. Who here knows what progressive web apps are? Theory. Huh? Theory. Just theory, just a bit. Has heard about PWAs, put them together, use them, seen them. Okay, a few of you. Who here has seen the service worker, knows what it is, service worker API? Okay, cache API, Angular PWA plugin, network information API. Okay, so everyone's going to learn quite a lot here. I like that. So let's take a look at the agenda. Now, I have to admit something. I had a problem. The problem was that when I put together this material, I wanted to share so much because there's so much about progressive web apps that I could talk you know, for two days just about this. And what I ended up doing is I created kind of two sample apps. One that I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you the code, we're going to go through it uh, relatively quickly, and then we're going to put together a relatively complex PWA as well, um, which will also you know, take a look at the various parts and see how that works. Now, when I ask the question, who knows what a progressive web app is and who has worked with service workers before, there were a few of you who said you, you know what it is, but I just realized that the majority of the people here are not that familiar with that. So we're going to have a crash course on PWAs and service workers. So I'm going to show you a very, very basic example so that you understand how a progressive web app is and what the service workers do and how a service worker enables the, um, a PWA functionality, okay? And then, so for those of you who already know this, please bear with me. I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. So we're going to take a look at progressive web apps in general. Then we're going to talk about service workers. Then we're going to talk about this thing called Workbox.js. Anyone familiar with Workbox.js? One, okay, so another 20 some people will learn something. Uh, and as I said, demos, and then we'll do some coding as well if time permits, but I'll try to speak fast. So, in a nutshell, what is a progressive web app? So there's lots of definitions, but I would like you to think about a progressive web app as just a website that acts as an application. And the key here is that it is a website that acts as an application because Basically, you can't say that every website is a progressive web app, but if you enable some features for that website, 
that make that website have some app-like behavior, then you can consider that to be a progressive web app. So what are those features? Right? If you think about a, a native mobile application, so these are applications that you install from your app store from Google Play. Right? So you look for, for an app, download it on your phone. That is what we call a native mobile app. So those native mobile apps have these features amongst many, many things, right? Offline availability, right? So all the apps that you have, you may not have network, but you can still launch it and you could still potentially interact with it, right? If it's a news app, you would probably see all their news and when you go online, then your news feed is going to refresh, right? That's, that's like a normal behavior. Uh, you also get notifications, so you get some new notifications in the app. And what progressive web applications also enable to, uh, for you to do is something called adaptive performance. So we're going to take a look at a very nice example on achieving this. So essentially, I want you to remember this. A progressive web application, that's the first sentence here, allows a web app or a website to be accessible by anyone regardless of what device they use and where they are in the world, meaning you know, what speed of network they use or what their location is. Okay, so the term progressive in the progressive web app also means that you give your users a progressive enhancement for their application, meaning if someone is on a 2G network, for example, you definitely don't want to, for example, stream an HD video for them, whereas if they are on a Wi-Fi, then you want to show them that video. Okay, so think about a single article, let's say it's about a a sport event where you want to show a nice video of, of some action, right? If you detect that your user is on a Wi-Fi, show the video. If they are on a 2G or on a slower uh, network, then show them a picture instead or maybe show them nothing, right? So this is progressive enhancement as well. So I think Google was the first company who, who come up with this sort of checklist um, and you know, the more of these you check, the, the more likely that your application on your website could be considered as a, as a progressive web app. So the first one is app-like. It acts and feels like a, a native mobile app. That's very simple. Connectivity independent. Again, very simple stuff. By the way, the reason why you see these weird bullet points is because I just changed the theme for the slide in the last minute because I realized I had a dark theme and you now wouldn't be able to read anything. So it's all going to be a bit weird. Uh, connectivity independent, works offline, simple as. Uh, discoverable means that you can install this and find the PWA. Now I'm going to link out to uh, an interesting article, uh, but we'll get to that as well. Fresh meaning that you get, you open the app and it should automatically pull, for example, the latest news. So it's always fresh if there's connection. Installable, that you can install it onto a mobile device. And we're going to talk about this as well. Linkable, that you can link to it, right? So if you think about applications on your mobile, there's no way that you can link to a, a native app. But because this is now a website, theoretically, you could link to parts of that as well. Uh, progressive, we talked about that. Reengageable means that once it's installed, your users can just get back to it as easy as possible. How do they do that? You will have a launcher icon in the operating system or on your mobile device and they tap it and boom your app opens. Responsive, uh, very straightforward thing. Um, if you are using uh, this app on, on a tablet, it should have the right dimensions. If you use it on a mobile phone, it should have the right dimensions. So it's standard web development responsiveness here. Safe, um, progressive web apps and especially the service worker API dictate that you must use HTTPS at all times. Okay, so using HTTP will not work with the service worker. Okay, so why progressive web apps? Um, there's a lot of reasons. Now, the, what I recommend you to do is take a look at the resources that you can find on Google's website. After the latest IO event, they released some more uh, use cases and case studies. They have a myriad of you know, use cases and what company changed from what kind of application to a progressive web app and they give you all sorts of numbers, that many users, that many sales, which led to this and led to that. But essentially, what you need to remember is that for some companies, they had a website and then they had a, an application in Google Play for Android and for iOS, right? And their users didn't like that. And then they said, okay, you know what? I would just create one simple website. If my user is on the 
on a desktop, I will show that website, and then I'm going to make a PWA out of that website so that if they're on their mobile, I will offer the option for them to install that, and then they can just keep on coming back. So it's basically one code base that they have to maintain. Uh, it's really easy. And there are some links here that you can read on how, for example, Pinterest and Twitter achieved you know, better performance, better sales, better user retention, better user engagement by converting parts of their applications or their entire application to a progressive web app. <coughs> so what are the core technologies that enable the progressive web apps? So let's start with the, with the second one, service workers. So without the service worker, you wouldn't be able to create a progressive web app. And for those of you who are new to this, I'm going to show you a very simple example and, and you will understand why. So without the service worker and without using this thing called the service worker API, you are not able to create a progressive web app. So that is the core to everything that is progressive web app. Um, then there's this, it's not really a technology, it's more like, a, as you see, a JSON file, manifest.json, that contains a metadata about the progressive web app. We're going to take a look at an example, what that metadata is, but essentially it's things like, where is the icon that is going to appear once you install the app? Uh, what should be the, the actual icon launcher text for that particular application? And these are the things that you specify in that manifest.json file. Then we also have the cache and the cache API, right? So if you think about a progressive web app, one of the key pillars of that is that it allows you to work offline, right? In order for it to work offline, it needs to store some of your assets. Where does it store it? It will store it in the cache, which you can manipulate using the cache API. Um, Lighthouse is a tool, again, that I, th I think is created by Google, but I'm not sure. It's definitely part of the Chrome DevTools as of version 60-something. It basically gives you uh, a score value, so you can run some tests, and it will tell you, oh, you know what? Your progressive web app is awesome. You get a score of 100, or it's quite bad. You get a score of 62, and they explain to you what you need to change in your app in order to improve that, uh, that score. And then quite recently they started, uh, and when I say they, it's, it's Google. And the reason why I mention Google so much is not because I'm a Google developer expert, it's also because they are one of the big companies who are advocating progressive web apps quite a lot. So they have a lot of resources and they put a lot of investment into educating people about this. So quite recently they have come up with this PRPL abbreviation, which they pronounce as PURPLE, which is short for Push, Render, Pre-Cache and Lazy Load. And what they say is that if you tick all these boxes, then you're like PWA master level 99, okay? You're, they're like the god of all PWAs. But they also say that if you just tick either of these, then you're also making a step forward at least having a better performing website, okay? So push refers to the HTTP2 push uh, thingy. I don't know how that's called, the, the push, whatever. <laughs> Uh, do you guys know what that is? Okay, so browser interaction 101. So what happens, you have your browser, you have the internet, and here's a web server, okay? So you type in something, cnn.com for example, and you go out here, this sends back the index file, so you get the index.html, and then your browser starts to parse this file. Right? It's going to find JavaScript files and CSS files as it keeps on parsing through your HTML file and it's going to go to the server and say, hey, I found a CSS file, can you please send it to me? Yes, I can. Okay, now I have it, so I will add the CSS and add the styling to my site. Okay, this is HTTP 1.1. This is how it works, okay? HTTP slash 2 push works um, differently. With this, you can sort of proactively tell the server that when you request an index file or index.html, you also want to request, let's say, an app.css file. So what happens? You go to a website, the server sends back index.html, your browser will start to parse it, it will get to the CSS state and it's going to want to make a request to the server saying, hey, could you send me that CSS file? And at that point, because you have asked that file to be pushed, the server has sent it even before the browser requested it. 
right? So the, the actual browser is going to say, you know what, actually I don't need it because it's already here. So it's just going to allow some, there are some keywords that I could throw at you like multiplexing, blah, 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 doesn't matter. Just better performance, okay? <laughs> Remember that. Um, render, precache, and lazy load. So, so precaching is something similar to push which allows you to sort of pre-cache your resources. And there are some techniques that allow you to kind of proactively get entire routes pre-cached. And I think Google, was it last year when they, when they uh, launched this machine learning based pre-caching something? So you, basically they learn the behavior of the users of a website and they will ahead of time believe that you will click a link and they will pre-cache assets that are required for that link. And when you click on it, it's going to load faster. Uh, lazy loading is another interesting thing. Imagine a, a website that shows you photos, right? A gallery of photos. And you're on your mobile device and you see three images out of 20, okay? So lazy loading means that you should only load those three images because there's no need to load the other 17 because the user is not going to see that. So you should lazy load it when the user starts to scroll, okay? So they say if you adhere to any of these or all of these, then you're going to have a much better performing website. And they also added these features to their progressive web app uh, collection of goodness or whatever. Okay, so service worker. So the service worker, I think the easiest way to think of it is to, to think about it as a, as a proxy that sits between your browser and the internet or the server where the, the site is being returned from. Okay, and I have an animation which is probably a bit broken, but never mind. So the service worker itself lives inside the browser. So you need to have what they call you know, the modern web browser. So of course, we had lots of jokes before about IE 6 and 7 and 9 and whatever. Older IE versions don't have it, but most modern browsers, including Edge, of course, have the service worker uh, enabled and you can use the service worker API. So normally what happens, if you go out to a particular domain, your request goes to the internet, to the server, and then the response gets sent back to the browser and then the browser parses everything. But what happens when you have a service worker enabled, activated and installed, is that every single request and response will go through that. This enables us to do whatever we want with this request and response cycle, right? It allows us to sort of massage the request, it allows us to take some responses and put them into the cache, which is already leading me to how we're going to utilize the service worker and the cache API to make uh, our website work offline. Okay, so the service worker is the key that enables a progressive web application purely because it can intercept these requests and you can do stuff with that request. So the other thing that we talked about, manifest file. So it's a simple JSON file that contains a lot more than this, but these are the key pieces of information that you in my opinion, at a bare minimum, should have as part of a manifest file. So add to home screen information. What is the name of the icon that you want on your mobile device after you've installed the app? So you can specify that there. Where are the icons for that app? What orientation should it? Should it start in a horizontal or in a vertical mode? Uh, background color and startup page. So what page should it launch when you tap that icon. So these are all things that you can specify using this manifest file. And then the browsers can of course pick this up and, and we'll see how that works as well. Cache API, so probably very straightforward. The cache API allows us to manage the browser's cache, which means that we can add assets to it, we can retrieve those assets. Um, the one thing that I will point out here is that every single browser from every single vendor on every single machine, uh, sorry, the cache size on every single machine is going to be different, okay? It's dependent on your disk capacity, depends on what version of Chrome, on what OS you are using. But the point of this is that, you know, let's say you have a very nice looking website which is very rich in media. So it's full of images and videos and you say, oh, I'm just going to cache everything, right? All the 500 megabytes of images, right? You can't do that. You have to be wary of the fact that you have a limited amount of space 
And there are some strategies that you can use to manage this space, which um, I think we'll take a look at as well. Now, caching strategies. Now, th there's more caching strategies out there. I'll tell you why I chose these five. There's a particular reason why I'm showing you these five caching strategies. So whenever you cache a resource or whenever you create a progressive web app, you need to find the appropriate caching strategy. And there's these five ones. Um, let, let's start from bottom to up here. So cache only. What does that mean? You make a request for something that is going to take a look inside your cache. Let's say you're requesting app.css. The request is going to take a look in your cache. Is it there? If it is, it returns it. If it's not, boom, can't find it. Network only is the exact opposite of this. It will always go to the network to find the resource. It will never go to the cache. Then we have cache first and network first. So cache first means that you request app.css. It will go to the cache. If it finds it in the cache, it returns it to your application. If it can't find it in the cache, then it falls back to the network. So it will try to make a network request and get that back from the network. On the contrary, network first works the other way around, right? So you request app.css, it will go out to the network. If it can't find it or if there's no network, it will fall back to the cache. And then we have this very first one, stale while revalidate. So this is an interesting one. This is almost like a, a race between the cache and the network. So the way this works is that you request app.css, and there's going to be a request to the cache and to the network as well. If it's in the cache, it's going to be returned from the cache. And then the version that you've received from the network will update whatever is in the cache. OK, so that's why it's stale while revalidate. OK, remember these. These are going to come back, and then it will all make sense why I talk about these were well, five st strategies. So workbooks. There was one person who was familiar with workbooks, I think. Um, <clears throat> Verbox.js is super awesome, like seriously. Um, if you've ever written service worker code, you may have come across situations where it just becomes way too complex to manage and there's lots of dark corners and hidden things that you know hidden traps that you can fall into um, so workbox.js is basically a set of libraries that it's almost like a wrapper or a layer above the service worker and the caching apis so basically comparing the code using the cache api and the service worker versus writing the same piece of code in workbox.js would be the matter of 20 lines versus one it's, it's really good. So we're going to take a look at this. Um, it has a lot of good options. Um, it basically, if you will ever create progressive web apps, then use Workbox.js. It's really, really easy to use. Uh, it has a plugin-based system. You can write your custom plugins. There's a lot of options that it can manage, which would take a lot of time to figure out using all these native APIs. Um, yeah, it's just. I'm really happy that I found it. And guess who is the creator of Verbox.js? Google. Me, yeah, right, no, Google. <coughs> but, but thank you. Um, although I wrote a plugin, but we'll get to that. Uh, OK, so progressive web app. So now you hopefully know what a progressive web app is or what to expect from it. And you're probably thinking, oh, that's great, but you know, I use React, I use Angular, how can I use this thing? So the good news is that, and this is just a very short list, if you Google my favorite framework, PWA, I guarantee that you will find some sort of plugin. So for Angular, it's Angular slash PWA, so all you need to do is ng add that and then progressive web app support is going to be added to your Angular app. Similarly, this is for Vue. Uh, Nux.js is a static site generator for Vue. That actually uses Workbox.js as well. Uh, so once you know how that works, it's just apply all your knowledge there. For React, you need to add Service Worker, or you just add Workbox to your project. Uh, Ionic, since that's based on Angular, that works as well. Polymer has PWA Starter Kit. And as I said, probably other frameworks have that as well. So the good news is that. The major frameworks have very good support for progressive web apps. OK. Now we're going to talk about this thing. It's, it's a, I, I put in concept in there because it uses one of the 
It's not that new, a fairly new browser API called the Network Information API. So the Network Information API, basically, anyone? I think I asked that, but no one said you knew it. OK. So what it does, it tells you the connection of the user who's browsing your website. So basically, if your user is on Wi-Fi or on 4G, it's going to return a string called 4G. If they use it on a 3G, it's going to return 3G. Anything 2G edge or lower is going to return a string 2G or slow dash 2G. What this means is that you can take this information and act on it, right? So you could do different renderings. You could do, um, and the example that we'll see is using Workbox. So you could, for example, render lower quality images for users who are on a 3G device versus people who use a Wi-Fi. So the reason why it's a concept is because it's, a ve it's, I would love for all the browsers to support this, but at the moment I think uh, Chrome and maybe Firefox supports it, but I think the others will uh, hopefully soon support this as well. So we're going to take a look at this as well because I have some code to show you and we're going to go through that. Right, excited? Okay, any questions so far? Yeah, I have a question. Like sure. You talked about downloading uh, the PWA, mm -hmm. but like I've, I've seen on Android, uh, in some instances like Vimeo, they have like something that's called like an instant app. So I just, I open a VPN and it's like instantly there's an instant app that's suddenly in my screen. It works like an app, but I, I don't know on the background if something downloaded or installed. Is, and I'm wondering, is that that's PWA as well? Probably at different? some point you yeah. installed it. I, I have. So it has to be installed. <coughs> yes, okay, it's not just going to crawl its way onto your mobile. It's it's you have to. There's going to be a prompt. You say install this. There's going to be something you know installing, and then the icon will appear. Okay. okay. Um, I, I didn't have the icon. It just opened the the, the application. Probably. Okay. I have no icon. Instant app icon. Okay. Well, we can take a look at that later. Okay. But yeah. theoretically, a PWA works. After, well, it works because it's a website, so you can go to any URL, you can use the website. But if you want to use it as an app, you would have to install it. But we're going to take a look at that. So, uh, where should we start? So, if you don't mind, I will sit down for this. Uh, quick poll, is this text large enough? It doesn't matter what it says there, but it, can you guys see it in the back? And white background works as well. Okay, because I changed this last minute. As well, so there's there's some people who are you know new to this whole PWA thing. So let me find a very simple um, example. So I did a very simple. I did a talk yesterday about less technical. PWA stuff for, for a, a coding bootcamp. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that, like a minified version of that talk and just show you what a PWA looks like in one second. Service worker code. So at least for those of you who haven't seen it or you don't know how to imagine this, you will understand it as well. Okay, so let me reset a few things here. Uh, Pretend you're not seeing this now. This is not happening. Cool. So here we have a very simple website that has an H1 element. OK? Hopefully, this is uh, nothing too difficult. So we're going to launch this website. Uh, and what you will find is that when you work with the service worker, so a few things. I use. Chrome almost exclusively when I create PWAs and I work with a service worker. Other browsers, as I said, support it, but I find the Chrome Dev Tools and their overall support for how you can debug and, and take a look at service workers to be the best. Okay, so that's why I'm going to stick to this. Uh, you can use any other browser if you want. So, at the moment, th this is our website. Okay, so there's a reason why you see that the service worker is red. That is because um, there's this app.css that applies the style, okay? Very easy to understand. So far, so good. Now, the basic, oops, the basic premise of a progressive web app 
is that when I go offline, is that, uh, let me remove the, hi. Um, I want to get rid of the, uh, okay, this is hopefully better. So notice that, and I probably moved this, but if you open your dev tools, you sh is that large enough for you to see in the back? Okay. You should have that application tab somewhere. Okay, I just moved it here because I access it uh, a lot uh, in my dev tools. And notice it has manifest, service worker, storage. Uh, somewhere here it has cache. So we're going to use all of this because this is the place that you want to be uh, when you create your PWA and when you test it. So offline. Right, so we want to make sure that this works offline, and probably this is something that you've seen millions of times, right? At the moment, we have a standard website, we are offline, nothing works, okay? Do you know how this thing is called? Steve. It's not, it's not Steve. <laughs> Offzilla or Downsore? Like, down, so, okay, it's fine. But you know of the game, right? Everyone knows the game. Jumpy, jumpy, no? Okay. Back to PWAs. Um, so probably you've seen this before, right? You're, you don't have network, your site doesn't work. So what can you do to fix it? Well, you can start working with the service worker. Now, the service worker, this is all what it takes to enable the service worker itself, okay? So we check whether the service worker is enabled for the browser. Um, it's probably good practice to do that because you want to make sure that you know, your users don't get any errors. And notice navigator.serviceworker.register. So .register is one of the methods that you can access in the service worker API, which allows you to register the service worker itself. And the service worker in our case is that JavaScript file. Okay, so the service worker is just another JavaScript file that you create. So what happens is that when you have this code, the browser is going to download, register, and then activate that service worker. Okay, so theoretically, if that's uh, correct, and this is a promise-based API, uh, we should see that service worker is good to go message in our console. So console, just refresh this site. Okay, service worker is good to go. So that means that we now have a service worker enabled, activated, and ready to go. So if I go offline, that should just work, right? No, why? Because we have just registered a service worker, but we haven't actually written any code for the service worker. We now need to write the code for the service worker itself. Okay. <clears throat> so let's ignore that's there. So let's just collect all the files that make up our application and put them into an array. Okay, so this is, as I said, the most simple example that you will come across probably. Index.html, we have an app.js, and we have an app.css. These are the three uh, pieces of, of the three files that make up our application. So what we can do is then this. So in line eight, we come up with a name for a cache. So that's going to be our custom cache in the browser. So I just gave it the name my hyphen cache. Self, so when you write service worker code, self always refers, to, always refers to the service worker execution context. So that's like the this in the scope of the service worker, okay? So self dot, and we add an event listener on install. So we say, when the service worker is being installed, then open a cache with the name, my cache. Open is going to either create our cache. We'll see what that means in, in just a moment. And then the real magic is cache add all files, okay? So it's going to create that cache and it's going to add all those files that we have specified from lines, uh, so in that array for the files. Does this make sense? Okay, so let's save this. Refresh, oh, go back online. Refresh this, so we have service worker is good to go. But now if under the application tab I scroll down, I have this section called the cache storage, and if I expand that, notice I have something called my cache. So that is the cache that I've just created, and if I click on it, I see that there are these assets in that cache. Okay, so now we have enabled this cache. So if I now go offline, will it work? 
No, it won't. Why? <coughs> I just keep on doing that with you. Uh, I like the dinosaur thingy. So why it doesn't work? We now have the service worker. We, are, we now have these assets in the cache. But we never told the browser what to do when it's offline and how to get these items from the cache, right? That is the last piece that we, that we need to add. So how do I do that? So this is where the real magic happens. <clears throat> so the way the browser works is that every time it requests a resource, so it requests a CSS file, a JavaScript file, an index file, it uses a fetch event. So it goes out and fetches app.css, fetches whatever, da 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 da. Okay? So in the service worker, we add an event listener for the fetch event, and then the real magic happens in line 19. So what happens? So in that block, line 18 to, what, 21, it basically says, take a look at the event request. So the event request is going to be localhost something something slash app.css. If you find that app.css in the cache, that's the response, the return it. Otherwise, so, or go and run your standard fetch event. So try to go out to the network. So what this is going to do is because we have we will have a match for app.css, app.js, and index.html. All of those resources are going to be returned from the cache itself. So actually, that piece of code after the OR is never going to be executed, right? So let's save this. Let's do go back online, refresh, hit offline, refresh. Oh, OK. OK. Oh, I, was, I was worried for a moment. OK, and, still, and everything works. OK, so I'm offline. I don't have network. This thing still works. And if you take a look at here in the console, I'm not sure how much you can see that, but basically it says request for app.js. And the reason why you see this here is because I added that log statement in the file. So now everything is being returned from the cache. So let me prove something to you. Let's say I forget to add app.css, OK? so. I'm not adding that. And here's another thing. So this is a good learning moment as well. Every time when you work with the service worker and PWAs, first of all, I already made a mistake. You should always test it on a private tab, because having tested so many PWAs, sometimes I go to localhost port something, and something just opens. Even though I'm not running anything, I'm like, what? So you will have this very fun things going on. Um, this is the magic reset button here, clear storage. OK, so you will use this. This is going to be your best friend. So if you scroll here, there's this clear side data. Make sure that everything is checked. And as you can see, it's going to unregister all the active service workers. It's going to clear the cache. So basically, it's like your big red reset everything button to normal. OK, and this is very useful because Sometimes you will run multiple service workers and multiple ports, and it just gets all very confusing. You come here, clear everything, start from scratch. OK, so that's what I'm going to do now. Make sure everything is deleted. And now, OK, it doesn't work. So let's go back online. So when we are online, we get the standard functionality. But when we go offline, remember, we now did not add app.css to the cache. So when we go online, we no longer get the style sheet applied. We still get the content, but because app.css is not in our cache, there's no way that the browser can get to that. So it will render whatever it can without the CSS. OK? So this is your most basic PWA works offline. For those of you who are new to this, does this make sense? Clear as mud. OK. I'm wondering which of the two caching techniques you use from the, from the here, it's, this is cache first. This is cache first. Right? Cache first, because you go to the cache first, and then you fall back to the network. So whatever the name of that was. Um, any questions so far? Sorry. Uh, what time am I finished? Am I finished at 4 or 5? Or I, does anyone know? Cause I can. It's at 5 o'clock uh, downstairs. But I think uh, I, but I'm not sure if it also applies to you. But I don't have it here. 4.30. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so any questions? No? Yes. 
Uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Well, we cached the four files. Yeah. Uh, the first one, just a stash. There was a reason for that, but I, I forgot. There's a particular reason for that, which I can't remember. So but, the but it could be, yeah, it, it could be to do something with how the service worker looks at the scope of your app, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But I, I, I'll need to check that up and I'll, I'll try to find that for you. Um, okay, so from this, you now understand how this all works, but uh, where is it? You know, let, let me show you another basic example and then we will progressively go to the sort of harder examples. Uh, PWA code, I wasn't planning on showing all this, but this is another uh, good example. So node uh, server.js, so this is running on localhost 80. So this is a slightly more complex example. Let me just clear everything because God knows what I've done before. So big reset button. Oh, you see, I was actually offline and I just loaded something. That's what I'm saying. It's crazy. So I'm online. It, it will load probably the same thing, but okay. So this example is, is kind of the same, but it has one extra thing added to it. This is like a news website, which I, I'm not a designer, as you can tell by the <laughs> wonderful design. This took me like a day just to make it look like this. Um, the only difference here is that this time the data that you see here is coming from an API. Okay, so there's actually, uh, if I go to localhost API slash news, th this is the raw data that gets parsed and displayed to you. Okay, so this is assuming that we're grabbing data from somewhere and displaying it in the application itself. And, oh, and you will see that if we go offline, this whole thing still works, okay? So I'm not able to refresh in a sense that I'm not able to go out to the API and get the latest data, but still, I can just see the data that was there when I last refreshed the application, when, my, when I was last online. So the way this is done is, it's all in this cache thingy here. So let's close this. So now you will see that I have two caches. I have this news cache, which is again, just the JavaScript file, the index file, and also what I want you to notice is that this looks a bit weird, like slash ajax, slash libs, etc. If you take a look at the service worker file itself for this particular application, you will notice that you can not only cache resources that are local to your device, but you can also go out to a, a third party CSS file or JavaScript file and put that into your own cache as well. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. And if you look carefully, there's another cache storage here called PWA news data cache, which just contains slash API news. But if I click on that, I probably need to do it this way. Okay. What you see here is that the entire response from the API is also cached. So this is what allows me to basically fetch this even though when I'm offline, okay? But it makes sense to put this into a different cache, right? Because you want to make sure that your assets are different from the API. Why? The API response inside the cache is likely to be updated more frequently than your static assets, right? It's, it's not likely that a CSS file or a JavaScript file is going to change every time when you go online, whereas the actual response from a news API is going to, um, get updated. So this application does a few more additional things. Um, first of all, it has a manifest JSON file. So you can take a look at a very basic one here. So name, PWA news, short name, name, and then an icon, which is an array of objects that specifies the icon in different sizes for when you install this app. And we're going to take a look at that in just a second, where the browser should look for the actual icon. And on top of that, we also specify the start URL. So when it is installed, and when you tap it on your mobile, where it should start. So is the root uh, display standalone. So this is what going to render our PWA in a 
separate window. So it's not going to open the browser, it's going to open a separate window on the device. And then background and theme color, you will see that in, in just a second. And there's one more thing that this particular application does. It accepts push notifications. So push notifications are a bit tricky because every push notification that you have or that you want to enable must go through a third party service. Okay, the reason for this is because imagine that you allow push notifications and then I as a developer can just spam you with whatever I want. Okay, so it has to go through a service and that service will send out a notification to all the devices that have enabled or allowed the notifications to happen. And how do I know that I have notifications enabled? Uh, this is particularly in Chrome. You know, you click this icon and notifications is allowed. So when it's ask default, what happens is that you know we refresh this site and probably you've seen this before right big magic reset button where a website does something similar to this okay this means that that website is likely to be a progressive web app and they want you to accept notifications. So notification can happen on certain conditions. So I'm going to allow this and then fingers crossed I'm going to try to send a notification to this app um, using insomnia. So what I'm going to do and the way this is done is I will send an HTTP post I'll, I'll zoom in on this sorry it's too dark maybe uh, so I'm going to send an HTTP post with a, a hypothetical new article to the API slash news endpoint that I have. And the way I've set up this application is that if there's a new article added, the PWA should receive a push notification, okay? Telling the user, hey, there's a new article uh, that just got added. So finger crossed, 50% chance that this is going to work. Okay, so I'm going to send and there we go, okay? so. I received a notification and what I did, I just put in the title and the name of the author, it's now gone, to the notification, okay? Now, theoretically, there's a lot more that you could do. I'm not refreshing the news feed, but you could also do that automatically and there's a whole lot of things that you could do. <clears throat> now, one more thing that I want you to realize, and we're not going to get into the details of that, but if I open the service worker, th this is it, right? It's it's complex, okay? There, there's a lot happening here. The reason why I'm showing this to you is because this is using the Service Worker API and it's using the Cache API. So it's using these native things. Next up, we're going to take a look at the Workbox example. And hopefully you will see that all of this is just going to be literally about 10 lines of code or maybe less, okay? Any questions on this? We're not going to talk about uh, this web push thing. There's uh, an NPM package that, uh, one second, there's an NPM package that allows you to do that pretty much out of the box. It's called web hyphen push. So NPMI web hyphen push. You just get some API keys, but I'll, I'll get you this code so you can see how it's done. Yeah. Could I just show you the? So what happens there is, is basically this bit here. So lines 36 to 50 something. So what, oopsie, sorry. <laughs> uh, so what happens is that we take a look at the request URL and if it contains slash API slash news, then we put stuff into the data cache Otherwise, so this is the code that you've already seen before in the very simple example, so that's exactly the same. And then here we have cached output and we put a cloned version of the, the response. That's how you would do it uh, for the API. I also want you to kind of, not memorize it, but just remember sort of how complex lines 40 to 49 look like. And then I'm going to show you the workbox equivalent of that, which is, believe it or not, one single line of code. Yeah. Uh, is there the PWA syntax here? It is uh, 
and uh, uh, another version of uh, that support. And I mean, uh, is it is it uh, defined at MFI? Oh, like how do you, okay, so how does the browser know where the manifest file is kind of? Yeah, sorry, I completely uh, forgot that. Uh, right here, right? So it's your index.html, you have to point uh, to the manifest file. I'm sorry, quite obvious, but that's how it's done. Uh, so one sec. Uh, so the preview is the standard of HTML5, right? Is it a standard? So every website could be made into a progressive web app. How? Adding the service worker, adding a manifest file, using the cache, that's it. Uh, you had a question. Uh, do we cache any of our normal modules? Uh, our normal? Node modules. Do we cache any of them? Uh, no, sorry, the node modules here is because I have a server file and that's, that's because I'm launching this from node to enable the push notifications. So you, you wouldn't even need that if you don't need, need that. Um, and the other thing is, click. Uh, so you may have noticed this before, but there's a manifest thing under application. So just where, you know, where the service worker thing is and where the reset button is, there's manifest. And it basically shows you the icons and everything. So you get like a visual representation of your manifest file as well. So why is this important? I have a wonderful simulator here. So I'm going to show this to you on iOS and then I have an Android version of this as well. So you often open Safari, you go to localhost, and so far this is you know, nothing special, you've seen this before. So how does this become a progressive, how does it become an app, okay? So in Safari on iOS, you tag, uh, tap that whatever button that was, and then you scroll a bit and notice there's this thing called add to home screen. Okay, so when you click on that, you will see some familiar things in there, right? You see the icon, that's from the manifest file. You see news, that was also in the manifest file, the short, short name. Notice the localhost slash, that was in the manifest file as well. So you hit add, and notice I now have an icon. Right? Or like a, a launch, or I have it twice, ignore that, that's from yesterday. But, but now I have that icon, and if I look at my phone now, there's no way that I could tell whether that's a, a native app that I installed from, from the App Store, or whether that's a PWA that I just added to my home screen, right? That's the, the whole point. And remember in the manifest file, we said uh, standalone, whatever that option was. So it will launch in a standalone window, so when you hit this, it will start a window which is not Safari, although it's based on Safari, that doesn't matter, and then now you get this app that you can scroll through. Now I can't bring the simulator offline, but it would now work offline as well. Yeah. Sorry, because of the AC I can't hear okay, anyone. So, um, like two or three years ago, on, when this only worked on Android, um, you, the user would get a pop-up saying, would you like to install this on your home screen? It's Is still there. Is this thing? And do you get this on, on iOS? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so, for this part of the room, if you didn't hear the question, the question was on Android you get, do you want to install this thing automatically? Uh, Is it possible on iOS? And kind of how that works, uh, I suppose. So on Android, that's still a thing. I have an Android test mobile with me, which we'll use very shortly, and then you will see how that works. Um, two points. N uh, one is that you can have a custom installer. There's an event that you can listen on, which is, I think, something like bef before install or some something like that. So you can actually replace the mobile's native installation prompt with your own custom one. And if you do that, that works on iOS as well with some teeny tiny modifications. So you, you can, on, on an iOS device, there's no automatic way of, of doing this. So iOS will not prompt you to install something, but you can programmatically put out a prompt to your users or have a button that says install, and then on that, it will do this automatically. OK. Where next? Let's take a look at a Verbox example, and then we will take a look at some additional things, and then we get to the big app that I I prepared for this workshop, which is going to be tested for the first time. So 
obviously because you come to a workshop without testing any of your applications. Uh, um, so I think I opened that already, so just one sec. So let me close all of these first. This is... No. Okay, let's take a look at first at a very simple word box example, so at least you know what it is and how it works, and I will show you a more complex example as well. Um, that would just probably make more sense. So back to our familiar application that has a simple H1 element of uh, service worker. But if we take a look at the service worker itself, uh, actually this one, you will see that it is a lot simpler. So what's happening here? The service worker API exposes this method or this function called import scripts that you see in line number one, which allows you to import any other JavaScript file into your service worker. Whether that's local or whether that's out on a CDN, you can just grab it. So workbox, this is, this is how you use workbox. Now, it has multiple sort of ways to function. You can use it via CLI to auto-generate uh, a service worker. You can use it using your favorite module bundle, so you can use it via Webpack, Gulp, Grunt, etc. Um, but the point is that you know, if you want to use it, you have to somehow import it. And this is how you do it in your service worker file. You say import scripts, uh, and it's my bad, they are now at version 4 point something. So that's a kind of older version. And if you import that file, it exposes a, a Verbox global. So if that's available, that means that Verbox is loaded. And then notice what we have here, workbox.precaching.precache and root. So this is something where Workbox is doing its magic. So adding that line and then generating a service worker based on this, I'm going to show that to you in, in just a second. Actually, let, let me show that to you now. This is the, the service worker build script. Very simple. Take serviceworker.dev.js, that's the file that you've seen just now. Generate the service worker, the GS file based on that. And the most important thing I think is this global patterns. So remember before we had the files array where we had index.html, app.css, app.js. Now if I would had 200 CSS files and JavaScript files, I would have to have enter that manually because there's no way that you can have a regular expression using the cache API and the service worker API natively arrives workbox.js that allows you to specify global patterns and say, you know what, star JS, CSS, HTML, it's going to cache all of those, okay? So when you run this build script, it will generate a service worker file. And what I want you to notice is that I kind of modified this, so let me node build. So this will hopefully regenerate this for us, so I close this. Okay, service worker, cool. So what I want you to notice is that it basically expanded the pre-cache and root array that we just put in there. So what Workbox calls this, I think, is like a placeholder. And it added all the CSS and JavaScript and HTML files that it found in the project where we specified this using the build script. It also added ones that shouldn't be there, okay? I should have excluded some. There's no point to have the build address in there, but Ignore that for now. And also notice there's a revision. What do you think that revision is for? Hash of the file. Why would you want to have the hash of the file in there? To update it the file. Exactly. So using this approach, Workbox will be able to automatically figure out which files to update in your cache and which not. So it will take a look at the revision number. And if I modify app.js, the revision is going to change. Therefore, Workbox will know I need to remove that from the cache and add the new version. All of this is done for you behind the scenes kind of automatically. Whereas if you would write this using the cache API and the service worker API, 
we would be on a two-day workshop just on that because it's very, very complex, okay? And when you launch this app, there's one more difference which may not have been that obvious before. Okay, so the result is going to be the same. And if you look at the console, uh, and I'm actually off, no, I'm not offline. If you look at the console, there's some Verbox related uh, messages in here. These messages only appear when you are working on localhost. So whenever you publish your PWA and it uses Verbox, it will not do logging. Okay, so it it's intelligently knows whether it's on localhost or not. Um, it's responding to things, it shouldn't respond to anything, but as I said, you know, reset the thingy. So when the first time when you load it, it's just going to say, it's going to say nothing. Okay. What did I do? Clear, I'm, I'm online. Maybe do it, maybe do it this way. Oh, oh, Workbox is loaded. Okay, so it pre-caches five files. Now, this is an important difference between what we've seen before and how Workbox works. And the key to understanding this is in this term, pre-cache. So think about this. You have a website, you load it for the first time, you, the service worker is going to be installed, activated and ready. The next time you refresh that website, that's when the service worker is going to do its job for the first time, right? Because at the initial load, it just activated itself. It wasn't there, right? Workbox can do pre-caching. So even on the first load, it can not only activate the service worker, but at the same time also put things into the cache, which means it eliminates that extra sort of refresh need for the application. Okay, this is what the term pre-cache refers to. So now if I go offline, everything works, okay? So all I needed to do was add one single line of code, run that build script, and everything has been taken care of me in a much more, I think, easier way than having to type all of this in, okay? And now I get all this version or revision control as well out of the box. So this is one thing that uh, Workbox can do. But let's take this to, to the next level. Because what it can, oh, I close this. Because it can do a lot more. Um, Clouding Workbox plugin example. And normally people ask me this question, and, and that's a very legit question as well, because so far what we've uh, done was taking a look at the websites that were kind of, they, they only had text, right? There was nothing visual about them. And, and usually what people ask is, that's really nice what you're doing there, but can you cache images? Okay, so here's the answer. Our updated news website, a lot more visual and a, a lot more, I don't know, visual. Let's just stick with visual. Um, I designed this as well, so maybe this looks better than the uh, other one. I take all the credit, um, and I wrote all the text, so just ignore that completely. It's completely fake news. Um, so what are we doing here? Okay, so this example uses, again, an API slash API slash news, so it caches the API, it caches the static assets, and it caches the images as well. So let's take a look at the service worker code for this. And especially remember how the service worker code, I think I deliberately didn't close it. Remember all of this to get the API news, put it into the cache, update it, da 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 da, da right? This was the, the first news page example, okay? Just look at it, keep on looking at this, okay? Ugly, confusing, you have no idea, even I don't know what's going on there. I wouldn't be able to write this again, okay? Not without Stack Overflow and Google anyway. Uh, and now, compare this with, where is my service worker file? Not this. I opened the wrong thingy, sorry. 
cover books. I meant to open this one, although they work in the same way. So service worker file. That's it. Okay. Workbox routing register root. You specify a root that you want to register. It accepts uh, regular expressions, whatever you want. So here I just say, whenever you say slash API slash news, workbox.strategies, remember the slides. Remember the strategies that we talked about? Stale by revalidate, cache first, network first, et cetera, et cetera. Those were also methods that Workbox exposes for you out of the box. Okay? So stale by revalidate, and you pass in options, like the name of the cache. That's all what you need to do. And this is now automatically going to cache the response from the API. It's going to go out to the network. And if it sees there's a difference between what is stored locally and what's remote, it's going to update the cache. This is what stale while revalidate does. OK? Does this look more simple? A bit. OK? So this is what I said before, that using Workbox has been a really, really good thing in my life because it's just so easy to use. Okay, and it does a lot more. We're going to get to this, but before we take a look at that, I'll, I will do a demo for you. So, I mentioned I work at a company called Cloudinary. Anyone heard about Cloudinary before? You're my man, and you're my man. It's awesome. And you're my man. You all will be my man and women, of course, sorry. <laughs> Very shortly. So. Uh, what does Cloudinary do? In a nutshell, we are a cloud-based media management company. So you take your media assets, those being images, videos, and, and some other uh, things, you upload it to us, and then we serve it back to you. Now, at this point, you're thinking, the Dropbox, fine. But what we do on top of that is image transformation, image optimization, the same for videos, and I'm going to give you a very quick demo of this. Um, and this is also going to lead me to using the Network Information API and doing that adaptive image loading thing that we talked about. So, starting from here, this is a stock image that we have. So what happens? You take an image, you have an image somewhere on your computer, you upload it to Cloudinary, and then you get an access URL, which looks like this. Okay, so something.cloudinary.com, name of your account, slash image, slash upload, and what's missing is, of course, the name of the file, woman.jpg. Okay, so this is a, a raw image. This is the image that was on your computer or somewhere, and you uploaded it. It hasn't been modified in any way. If you look at the network tab, if I refresh this, then we should see this. Uh, so this is a, a JPEG image, where did it go? Which is 570 kilobytes in size, okay? I want you to remember 570. All with me? What's the number? 570. 570. Perfect. So what I'm going to do, so what Cloudinary allows you to do is we have a bazillion APIs, from Angular to React to Node to Ruby to PHP, careful with the um, extension cable, uh, which you can use. But we also allow you to just directly manipulate the URL, the access URL of the image, and then based on that, things are going to happen. So we, I'm going to add a few. The first one is Q underscore auto. What do you think Q underscore auto is? What, what is the Q in there? Quality, exactly. So, excuse me. So what QAuto is going to do, it's going to reduce the quality of this image in a way that it's not going to be visible to the human eye. Okay? So what I want you to do is look closely to this image. And what's the magic number? 570, exactly. It's good that you're listening. So I'm going to hit enter. And that's going to go to our service and get a newly generated image. What I want you to see, or very focused on, is whether you see a visual difference in the newly loaded image. 
Okay, it's a very big screen, so you tell me. Okay, it's done. Is it the same? Is it blurred? Seriously? <laughs> Never ever has said that before, but okay, let, let me zoom back. Because that, that's, the, that's the normal resolution. Okay, so do you notice something very interesting? So what was the number? What is the number now? Okay, so we already saved a lot, right? So 49 kilobytes without, except for you, <laughs> without visually modifying the image. But, but seriously, if you, take, if you take a look at it, it's really not that visible. It's not that it's really pixelated. It's, it's barely visible. But the difference in the size is really significant. Okay, so we can do a lot better than this. Who here has heard about the format of WebP? A few of you. Uh, so basically, WebP is an image format that Google has came up with, I don't know how many years ago, which basically says they, they found a better algorithm to, to compress images. And Chrome, and I think maybe Firefox, supports that, but no other browsers support it. JPEG XR is another image format that Microsoft has come up with, which is a better uh, compression algorithm than JPEG, and they expect uh, IE browsers to receive this format. So therefore now, if you want to serve the right image format for the right browser, you need to have a JPEG, a, a JPEG XR, a WebP, and God knows how many others, right? Which is, pardon? And JPEG 2000 for Safari, exactly, right? So it's like all very confusing. Now. Let's add f underscore auto. What do you think f is for? Format. So f auto format. Uh, we make that request. So what I want you to take a look at now is when I open this header, is that even though, so if, if you look here, it's, it's a JPEG image, but Cloudinary knows that I'm using uh, Chrome, and it knows that WebP is the best compression algorithm for Chrome, so it sends a WebP file back. OK. Remember the magic number? 570. Let's update that magic number. What was it, 49? So 49 is our new magic number, OK? So WebP, 32. OK, so 32 is our new magic number. So you think, oh, no way he's going to reduce that. <laughs> think again. <laughs> so normally, when you see this image, you would want to upload it to probably like a profile image kind of thing, right? So this is now what thousand by it's here thousand by six hundred and eighty-eight pixels in size. That's way too big. So let's say width two hundred and fifty and height two hundred and fifty. This is now going to generate a two hundred and fifty by two hundred and fifty image. Size went down to new magic number six kilobytes, but it's not the prettiest image, right? Very not. We can fix that. So let's say that we wanted to really create a thumbnail. So we say crop this as a thumbnail. And I'm going to add this G underscore face, which is short for gravity face. So we're telling our system, find the face on this image and put that into the center. And voila, OK? This is what we got. And just for good measure, let's add r underscore max for maximum radius. And now we have our profile image, 7.8 kilobytes. The rounding obviously increases the size a bit, but we went from 572, what did I say? So eight kilobytes, which is very big savings right there. Um, also, the point of this is sometimes I see developers taking an image and applying CSS to it to reduce the size and do all sorts of things, that's bad practice. Why is it bad practice? Because you're still downloading the 1,000 by 688 pixel image, which is 570 kilobytes, which is not that bad in, you know, theoretically, but imagine times 20, okay? So you have the same images, same size, 20 times. 
that's a lot. Whereas if you just do Q auto and F auto, you reduce the size by I don't know how many percent. Therefore, maybe downloading the 20 images altogether is going to be 570 kilobytes. Um, maybe if there's time, I'm going to show you some additional things, what uh, we do with videos. There's definitely, let me actually show you one video example before I forget, because yesterday I forgot that. Um, question is, where did I put the video? MP4. I think it's this one. So imagine that you have a sport, uh, a website. This hopefully it's not going to be that loud. No. Okay. So let's say you have uh, a website that is about sports, and you know you want to show a video, obviously you know in a reduced size inside that article. Now this is this is an HD video, and as you can tell from the wonderful Wi-Fi connection here, it's not even loading properly. It's about 10 seconds in size. Uh, and I don't know how many kilobytes or even megabytes uh, large. The point is, is that, and, and that this is related to somewhat to web performance and somewhat to progressive web apps as well. The thing that you need to remember with regards to progressive web apps and web performance is the fact that, as I said, I think on the very first slide, that it, this web app should be made available for everyone regardless on what connection they have and what device they are using. Therefore, on an older device, I think Google now has this Motorola something as their test device, which is a very old device. And if you want to have a really good PWA, you should be able to run it on that site, with, on that uh, device without a problem. Now, there are two things that you need to remember. First of all, some of your users who use your site or your web app or your progressive web app may have some very old devices you should still give them a relatively good experience in using your site because otherwise they will just you know, leave and, and never come back. Second thing is that not everyone has access to you know, 4G and 5G and very super uh, fast Wi-Fi networks. And that leads me to two things. First of all, expecting someone to load this video on like a 2G connection, it's never going to finish, right? It's never going to load. Second of all, also if they have a 2G connection, that may mean that their data plan is not endless. They may have 100 megabytes per month. <coughs> Just downloading this, 50% of it is gone in like, what, 10 seconds, right? You don't want to do that to your users. So one idea is, so this is our video. So one idea is to instead generate an image for them. Now in Cloudinary, all you need to do is take that MP4 and just type in JPEG. And now you have a still image, which is in the, this is the middle frame from the video. You apply F auto, Q auto to this, and now you have still given a visual experience to users, but they're going to download two or three kilobytes worth of, of an image, right? So this is again, just making sure and remembering the experience for your users, okay? So they should be able to have still a visual experience regardless of what connection they use, where they are, and what mobile device they use. Okay, <clears throat> do you want to have a break? Because I realize I've been speaking a lot for like an hour and a half now. So le let's take a quick break. <clears throat> 10 minutes works for everyone. So that's 10 minutes past half. So that's what, 3.40, uh, 2.40. Uh, we're going to resume with discussing this app. It's <clears> called <throat> Really? Yeah, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. You, I stand corrected. Because the last time when I checked it was like Downasaur. Yeah, maybe it's, it's, it probably has many names. It's so popular. It's probably, but, but it's a funny little thing. Yeah, it's, it's awful. Steve the Dinosaur. Thank you. I didn't even uh, I've seen the screen so many times at the 404 screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I never realized there was a game hidden beneath it. It was the first time you've seen it? No, or? no, no. It, like oh, maybe okay. storage and da 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 da. So what this does. It says cache images from, in this case, from Cloudinary, but it could be local, doesn't matter. So cache images, but only add 50 images to the cache, no more. Purge on quota error, true, means that if you go above 50, then delete the oldest one. So you get this nice rotation. So you will never go above 50 image assets inside your cache. 
Okay, you can set this number to 10, 25, 100, remembering you know, the sizes of your images and the storage that you have available. But I think 50 seems to be like a, a, a good starting point. <clears throat> so does this make sense so far? You understand, uh, one second, you understand how Workbox works at the moment, right? How easy it is to use. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah. Is it taking into account the errors when? Um, I think the per because we set this to true, yes. I think I, I would need to look it up in the docs, but I think I read it once that says if you magic, sorry, <laughs> if you uh, run out of space, I think it will just start deleting it. I think it's this option that sets it. Okay. So, line 52, Cloudinary plugin, what does that do? So as I said, Workbox is not only good for creating or, or sort of abstracting away the complexity of the service where you create API code, but it also allows us to sort of extend or add our custom logic to it via plugins. So Cloudinary plugin, uh, Add, so I think in this example, it's sort of hard-coded in here, but anyone can write a plugin. So I created this plugin, I released it, and then Google has added that to their Workbox documentation. It's all very nice, and it's there, and I'm super happy about it. Um, so you can write any sort of extension, and you can submit that to Google, and if it's good enough, they will uh, consider it adding to, to Workbox JS docs, and they will write all sorts of nice things about it you and the plugin. So what does this plugin do? So remember we talked about the Network Information API. So Network Information API is available under this navigator. Uh, so we say if navigate, but well it's not an if, but we say if the navigator.connection is available, so the network information is available, then get this thing called the effective type. Okay, so this is what I mentioned that this Network Information API allows us to capture the connection speed of the user. And as I said, it returns a string value, 4G, 3G, 2G, or uh, slow-2G. Also remember what I said about the service worker. That it acts as a proxy that sits between the, the inside your browser and the network, and it's able to intercept your request response cycle. So the combination of this knowledge <coughs> allows us to do this thing here. We basically look for JPEG, PNG, and other type of uh, extensions. We break up that particular URL. Then we check whether the navigation or the network information API is available in the browser for the user. Then we check for the connection and we say, if they are on a 4G connection, then use QAuto. What I didn't say before is that you can pass in flags so that, remember QAuto, that's the automatic quality. So good, echo, and low, each of these is going to reduce the quality in a more aggressive fashion. So QAuto good, I think that's a default one. So that's, that is going to modify the quality in a way that is not going to be that visible for you. Echo is going to apply a more aggressive uh, compression algorithm. And low is going to, that's where you will kind of start to see some pixelation going on, okay? But the result is that you get a smaller image the lower or the slower the connection is, okay? And then we then reconstruct the URL, you know, joins and whatever, and the key happens in line 41 right here. So what we do, we basically go to the URL, check the network information API, check the connection of the user, and then we reconstruct the URL and send it back as a new request, right? This is this should be like the light bulb moment of the service worker being able to request, um, intercept the request, do something with it, and send a modified request out to the internets, the big internets, right? So new URL will now contain either QAuto good, low, or I forgot about <laughs> I work at a company, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, so one of the QAuto versions is going to send that and passing you know, just the original headers that came in the request. So the only thing that we modify is the URL. So what this allows us to do is, 
the following. <clears throat> let's close this now. Uh, so let's take a look at this image here. Now let me reset everything. That's the, that's the best thing to do at this point. Uh, clear, go back to online, network, refresh. So when this image loads, Where is it? Okay, 80, uh, come on, Jake will come back. 84 kilobytes, okay? So that is the uh, uh, sort of original size of our image. And if you look at the URL, it just, I don't know how much you can read that, but it, it, there's nothing in the URL, it's just image upload, PWA, and then the name of the file, that's it, okay? So let's now go and do throttling. So how do I do throttling? Under the Network tab, next to the offline checkbox, you can also do throttling using the DevTools. So you can sort of emulate a 3G connection, or 2G, or whatever. <coughs> you can also add your custom ones. So I'm going to say fast 3G, and I'm going to refresh my application. And if I now take a look at the file that got returned, where is, where is it? So it's 33 kilobytes as opposed to the 80 something that we had. And if you take a look at the URL, notice Q auto echo, and I didn't show you that, but I also added F auto just for a good measure. So basically now we injected this into the URL. Why? Because we wanted to make sure that if someone is on a 3G device, they don't get, you know, we're saving them kilobytes here. And on a 3G or on a 2G connection, saving, you know, 20 kilobytes here. So we have how many background image, Three images, say 20 kilobytes each, 80 kilobytes. We save someone, right? Or you know, sometimes the savings can be uh, even bigger. Now, this, as I said, um, is sort of a concept. Some browsers, like Chrome, uh, do support this, but I think uh, it, obviously other browsers will support this as well. And I think this is going to be a very good way to give sort of an adaptive performance for images for your users. Also, remember the progressive thing from PWA, progressively enhanced applications. The faster speed I have, the better sort of experience I give to my user. Okay, so this helps you to achieve that as well. Any questions on this? Okay, what I didn't say before, <clears throat> and I, meant to. So this is for those of you who are new to service workers and stuff. So under the network panel, you see these cogwheels here. So every time when you see that, that means that that response was either coming back from the cache or something that has to do with the service worker. Okay, so this is how Chrome sort of denotes or, or, or demarcates that for you. So when you see that, it means that this file was uh, received or, or manipulated by the service worker. Okay. So normally you wouldn't see that, so in the earlier requests, but if you scroll down, you see that, for example, this, the news, because it was available in the cache, the service worker knew of it and it returned it from there. So that's just for debugging purposes. Okay. I'm just thinking what I'm forgetting, but I think we can go back to the slides because now we're going to create another PWA, which is going to be, well, as I said, it's either going to work or not, but we'll see. So now everyone knows about service workers, caches, you know about workbox, so we can create something. So what I came up with is an interesting app that allows you to take selfies because why not? <clears throat> so it's an Angular application that uses the Angular PWA plugin. Now, interesting enough, Workbox being a Google product, Angular being a Google product, Angular PWA does not use Workbox. The reason for that is twofold. First of all, Workbox was created at the same time when Angular created this PWA plugin, so there was nothing that they could have used, and then they were concerned about some caching mechanism in, in Workbox, and I asked the, the creator of Workbox just like yesterday, and the answer he gave was, I should quote that, he said, 
At this point in time, I cannot give any publicly available information as to whether Workbox is going to be implemented into Angular or not. There you have it. I think that's a yes, but it's fine. I think, I th you know, Workbox is really cool, so I think they're going to somehow integrate into Angular. Then we have an interesting candidate here. So anyone is familiar with Firebase, Firestore? I'm not dancing, I want you to. Okay, some of you. So basically it's like, a <clears throat> it's an online, real-time database thing. Uh, the reason why I'm using it here is because you will see the app in a minute. You take a selfie, that image is going to appear in a feed and then everyone else who is opening up the app will see that picture appearing. So it's like Firestore or Firebase is capable of distributing in real time data to all the connected devices, okay? What's interesting is that it also works offline. Not the redistribution, but you can still access data from Firebase even though you're offline. In fact, I just learned, I think, a few days ago that the latest releases that Firebase and Firestore did basically enable, you know, there's like 100% PWA support for them. So they support things like authentication even when you are offline. They sync data when you go online, so this really, really good stuff that they do. So definitely check out Firebase and PWH, so just Google for that. Uh, we'll use Cloudinary to, of course, store and transform those images. So what should this app do? Uh, should work when we are offline. That's the whole point why we're here. And here's an interesting point as well. So what I want this application to do is even though if I'm offline, I want to still able to take an image of myself because who wouldn't want to do that? And then when I next go online, I want that picture to be uploaded immediately. Okay, so this is going to be something that we will add as well. <clears throat> Second time we get excited. So uh, I'm a bit worried because as I said, I, I've only tested it locally, but we will see now. So let me first show you how the application looks like. Uh, using this wonderful thing here. So, this is my test device, which is a Nexus 5, which sometimes breaks because it's really, really old. Great it was a very good phone, though, exactly. Anyway, you see, okay, so you will see what I'm doing on the phone here. Um, so, I published this app somewhere. I'll give you the link, but this is how it looks like. What you will notice is that in a few seconds, or did I? What? Wait, let, let, me, let me do something. <clears throat> Hit the big reset button as well, uh, which you can do. <clears throat> if you're interested on how to do this, I can show, oh no, I can't do this. Because not, it's not on local host. <coughs> Let me load this again. So basically what should happen is that I should see a notification saying that this is a PWA, although I have installed this yesterday. Anyway, so on Android, sorry. You see it now? Yeah. So on Android, you remember on iOS we had the the little arrow on the bottom add to home screen. On Android, you go at least, I don't know if on all Android versions, you go to this traffic light button and then you scroll and there's this thing called add to home screen. And then you get something similar to what we had before, right? So there's a custom icon, the name, and some additional things. So let's add that. You see that it's adding. Oh, someone, the notification arrived. Who was asking me that? Who was I talking to about the notification from the news app? I was talking to someone, I can't find a face. Anyway, it worked, it's here. Doesn't matter. So edit to, I don't know if you can read it, but it says edit to home screen. Uh, we have an, okay, let's wait for the advert because I'm using a free version. I'm not paying for this. <clears throat> Thank you. This is not the PWA, okay? Before, <laughs> before you, that's, that's not it. It's just, uh, it's visor that I'm using, okay. yeah, and it's, as you saw, ad supported. So I installed it. SelfieMator is available as an application, so I can now open this. 
right? So it works inside its own little, little window. At the moment, I refresh, there's, there's nothing. So let's do capture. So let's do this. OK, I got two options, retake photo, use photo. I will just use this terrible photo. And when we say use photo, it is going to go back to the feed, upload it to cloud, and then you apply transformation. Boom, it's there. So what happens when I now go offline? OK, so I kill the Wi-Fi. I'm also in airplane mode, so I'm not connected to the internet. The applicant, let's close that. And now moment of truth. <clears throat> you are offline the image should show as well oh phew. okay so it warns me that I'm offline on two different locations you can't see it there you go so it warns me on two different locations there was a, a snack bar notification that went away I probably overdone this is just trying to show you what you can do in order to tell your users that they are offline okay but I can still the point is I can still see this and use the app I can use it to the extent of taking a picture. Uh, I should put a different face now. OK? And notice now I have use photo and upload later, as opposed to just use photo, because I'm offline, right? So I say, OK, this is, this is good enough, so let's use this. Uh, since you are offline, your photo will be uploaded next time you go online. All these you know, messages that I came up with, OK, got it. So let's re-enable the Wi-Fi, come back to the app and be patient because this is an old phone. But what should happen is that at some point in time, it should find that there's a JSConf network somewhere. It didn't, so let's help it. Oh, hello, JSConf Asia. <clears throat> what is the 2G? Is that like a, really a 2G speed? No, I'm asking. I really don't know. Oh, is it two gigahertz? Ah, so I should. Okay, let's connect to that then. JSConf. Okay, so JSConf Asia connect, saved. Great, but don't, okay, connecting. Okay, so quickly. You can still see everything. Okay. Waiting for the network. At home, this worked a lot better, I have to tell you that. Um, nope. Retry what, sorry? Yeah, I did that. Connecting. You see, it's not, it's not connecting. Connecting. But the other one doesn't even appear, you see? It's the LA connected, no internet. Wait, connected, no internet. Allow USB debugging. What? Yes. And now you can't see. So it says uploading photo taken at whatever time, and it will go back to the feed, and you, we would see that thing. But this, everything now just broke. So you get the idea, right, of what's happening. OK, so um, how to do this? I wanted to do like live coding with you, but I think we won't have time to do that. Um, anyway, so it now just uploaded. OK, so now I have these two images. So what I want to do is, so if you want, you can try this app as well. Uh, I tell you one thing iOS, Safari, yeah. don't expect magic, okay? It, it kind of works, like the video feed is super laggy, I don't know why. Uh, you have to press play, then you pause, then you shrink the video, then you take the snapshot and it won't work offline. I'm still working on that. So if you're an Android, by all means try this. Also, if you're not going to take this offline, you can try it on your... Um, iOS device and the address is I think I already put it <clears throat> somewhere here it's this one can you guys re uh, I'll put it in uh, black and bold 
At least I think that's the one. But let me quickly check that. I actually used a different version of it, but hopefully that's going to work as well. Um, let me load this. So let, let's put it here. Let's put that there. OK. Um, somewhere in the app, it does say that I will delete the images that you take. OK, promise. So feel free to try it. And I'm going to delete all the data uh, later on. You're getting an error saying. Uh, but now it works. Oh, hey. I think it's probably because the network is yeah. slow. Try. It, if, oh, yeah, if, you, if, you want to, um, if you don't want to use your phone, you can also use your laptop. It should work on your laptops as well. And what we should see, if someone is brave enough to take a picture, it should appear in the feed automatically on everyone's device who is connected to the website. <clears throat> so what is enabling that? Is the is Firebase, right? Oh come on, who did that? It's selfie mater, it's selfie. Anyway. Um, so what enables this is is Firebase, right? So Firebase basically, as I said, is like an online uh, and I went blank was the word. It's not distributed database. Um, online that it sends all the data out to all the connected. I don't know the word for it. It's not the Huh? I pressed like the submit button like 10 times. Oh, so you're, you're trolling the system. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> it's fine. WebSock is, but there's a real time. Firebase is a real time database. So every connected device is basically going to see all these updates because the database receives an entry and then it pushes out the update to everyone who is looking at the site, either on mobile or on, on web, and someone is trolling my application quite badly. Um, also, what I do is, obviously, I do that face detection thing from Cloudinary. So that's why you take a picture. Even though your face is not in the middle, it's going to generate uh, an, a thumbnail where you see your face is in the middle. I'm, I chose you <laughs> for demonstration purposes. OK? So this is the app. Uh, if you try this on a mobile, you can try to bring your mobile off, uh, edit to the home screen, try to bring it offline and play with it and see whether that works. Um, also, one more thing. So <clears throat> I really wanted to show this to you, but I can't get back to the GSConf Asia. Oh, it's connecting now to GSConf Asia. Yes. OK, so let's try to do this again. Uh, visor, no devices. What? Dum -dum. Visor. OK, so let me do this USB enable, USB debugging, and Roy thing. <coughs> uh, settings. I'm doing this because I want to show you something in particular on this Android phone. So just bear with me for one second till I enable this thing again. Build number. Tap it seven times. Um. Okay, connected <coughs> visor quit. OK, I give up. 
sorry, I don't know why this is now not working anymore. I'll show you another example. So believe it or not, as of I think two or three weeks ago, you can run Microsoft Edge on a Chrome device as well. Chrome, ugh, you see, I'm, it's getting late. On a Mac device, okay? So this is Microsoft Edge running on my MacBook. So what happens, <clears throat> and this is the same behavior that you would see on an Android device as well. I don't know if any one of you has opened the Android device. On the bottom, it should have said something like add to home screen or something automatically, right? Some of you are nodding. So this is because this is a PWA. Android and Chrome automatically detects that and offers you the, the actual installation automatically, OK? If it d didn't offer it to you, you can always tap traffic lights, add to home screen. So what's also very interesting is that if I open this PWA on an Edge browser, what should happen is that at some point in time, notice that I get this plus icon that says install. OK? So this is in the address bar of my Edge browser. I can click on that. And what I will get is this installation. So also, this, the Edge browser now detects that, hey, this is probably a, a PWA, and it offers me to install that automatically. So I can click Install. And what this will do, it will actually give me this separate window that I can use just like an application, OK? So that's, this, is when, this is what you should envision when you think about a progressive web app. You go into, a, a, you visit a site using the browser, it acts as a website, but you install it and it kind of looks and feels like an application. Okay, so this is the core premise of this progressive web app. <coughs> okay, so, so I have, I, I can show you the, okay, Microsoft Edge, go away. Um, I can show you the, uh, the, the, the code base for the application. So I have prepared two separate repositories. They are well hidden here. So let me make those black and bold. So uh, someone, wanted, uh, someone was asking me during the break whether I am going to give access to the repositories. Uh, so this the two links that you see on GitHub are to the self emator examples. One is the starter, just a standard Angular app. No PWA, nothing. You, you want to take it offline, it won't work. Final is what we should have <laughs> arrived to. So that's the working version. I'm going to show you some bits of the code as opposed to try to code that together. Um, and I did show you some very basic service worker examples as well before and some very basic Workbox examples. I wasn't actually pre prepared to, to show those, so I will add those repositories to my slides and then you will get access to the slides so you will be able to access those as well, okay? But for now, just take a look at these. I think I made them public, so if someone could just quickly try that. I think I just did that, okay. So remember, the starter, if you check that out, you do an npm install, and then you do a, um, and here's the thing. Yeah, for the starter, you can just do an ng serve. If you're familiar with Angular, that's going to start an HTTP server, and then you can go to your browser and check that out. For the final version, because it uses the service worker, ng serve will not work. You either do ng serve dash dash prod. I probably should have added this into somewhere in there. So ng serve dash dash prod or you actually have to build your application, which is ng build dash dash prod, okay? So it's e either the two. Just remember that when you have a progressive web app and you use Angular, you need to make sure that you run uh, a production build of that. <clears throat> so what we will do because of lack of time, uh, I'm going to explain to you the final version and just, uh, if you want, okay. You can, or just you can look at my screen because I'm going to talk about this anyway. Just take a picture, make sure that you know where that is, and then later on you can come back to it and, and check it out. <clears throat> well, literally check it out, actually. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll sit down for this, if you don't mind. 
I just close it. I just saw that I closed it. So, okay. <clears throat> uh, quick show of hands. Who is here familiar with Angular? And everyone else is not familiar with Angular. Okay, it's fine. I will try to concentrate on the PWA bits and, and how this is achieved sort of agnostic to the Angular context because this context, so, so this, you know, storing something in local storage, uploading when you're offline could be applied to whatever else. It doesn't have to be Angular. <clears throat> so for those of you interested in Angular, what, what you need to do, and actually I prepared some steps as well, but basically you do ng add at angular slash pwa. That is going to add all the files and all the support necessary for the Angular project to be able to act as a progressive web app. As a next step, you need to configure how the service worker works, which you can do in Angular using the ngsw, so the Angular service worker config JSON file. And in this file, I have and you know, th this is slightly different from what we've discussed, but still follows kind of the same pattern. So what we have here is an asset group, app, prefetch, all the static assets for the application, which is really just the index.html file and all the CSS and all the JavaScript files. Okay? We've done this, but in a slightly different context, using the service worker. Okay? So this is just a config file that does that. And then what we have is the second section where we specify some uh, URLs that I want to cache. So these are sort of external third-party uh, resources, right? So fonts, uh, what is it? Yeah, fonts and, <coughs> excuse me, fonts and the cloud image assets, right? So I want to make sure that the service worker is aware of that and it can cache it. Now the way this Angular PWA thing works it's kind of similar to Verbox in a sense that you specify uh, regular expressions and then Angular is going to generate the service worker based on this config file. Okay, so it's automatically going to generate that for you. So you don't need to manually write the service worker. I'm guessing it's the same for Nuxt, you just install the module. And so, no, for Nuxt, okay. that's the view SSG. Yeah. Okay, so for Nuxt, remember from my slides, it actually uses Verbox. So when you use Nuxt, I think you just, I, I did that before, but I can't remember, you type in some sort of a command, it creates you a blank service worker where the first line is just going to say import script uh, workbox, and then you add your own workbox logic to that. And as I said for React, so I don't know any React developers, I'm not really good, oh, everyone's like, Whoo. I'm not that good at React, don't beat me up. Um, I don't think there's a separate plugin for it, but you can just add the service worker file and register it and just get on with your life. Or use Workbox. That's it. I don't think well, there's a plugin. Do, both, so we just it's either one, yeah. So if, if it's something simple, use the service worker API. If it's something more complex, like you want to try this adaptive image loading in a React context, you know, you create a service worker, import Workbox, write your code, add that to your index.html file, you know, the registration script, and that's, that's all what you need to do. <clears throat> For something more, Angular is obviously a larger framework than React. It's slightly more complex, so probably that's why, have, that's why they have this, uh, all these config options. But again, this is you know, somewhat similar to, to what we've seen before. Okay, <clears throat> I also created a service. Actually, this was quite tricky, so if this is going to be interesting for, for those of you who are Angular developers. So I had an issue whereby I had used, I actually forgot what I used. Uh, so I'll tell you what this service is doing. This service basically takes a look at the uh, navigator.online value. So navigator.online either returns true or false. It returns true if you are online. It returns false when you are offline. Well, kind of, right? Um, Yeah, and that's regardless of Angular, right? So even if you're in your dev tools, you just type in navigator.online. At this point, it should return you true because you are online. You check that offline checkbox. 
in DevTools and it should return you false. So what I do here, I created this observable to actually check whether, so check the change between the online and the offline state in the browser, okay? And this is going to be important because this enables me to do many, many things, right? This enables me to notify you whether you are offline or, off or online using that red little bar on top. It also allows me to say, if I was offline and now I'm online, I want to check local storage and if there is something in local storage, I want to upload that. So I just separated this logic into this service. Now the problem that I had, and I had to take a look at, there's a very good talk on Angular observables by Joe, no, <laughs> I forget the guy's name. Uh, he did a talk at Angular something conference last year, or maybe earlier, earlier this year, where he explains how the different uh, observables and subjects and everything, how, how that works in Angular. So that helped me a lot because what my issue was is that I have a feed component, I have the capture component, and then if I took my browser offline while I was at the feed component, then I changed to the uh, capture component, the browser thought I'm, I'm online, even though I was offline. And I had to refresh, and that's when it updated itself. And that was because I messed something up with these observables, but I can't remember what it was. Uh, but I knew I had to create this behavior subject, and that kind of solved it. Anyway, that's only important for Angular developers. For everyone else, what you need to remember, navigator.online, if you are online, returns true. If you are offline, returns false. Okay? So I separated this into a service just for easy access. So at the app component level, <coughs> uh, I'm trying to look at the important bits here. So there's quite a lot of code here, but let's kind of try to pick the, the most important things here. Um, so first of all, notice line 29. Behavior subject observable that subscribe online. So I'm going to take a look at my connection service and I'm going to check whether I am online or offline. So if I'm uh, not online, I show this snack bar that comes from the Angular material library. It's just, you know, uh, a little snack bar that pops up. Uh, otherwise, so if I am online, I check whether I have any items in my local storage, okay? So if I have any items in my local storage, that means that someone took a picture while they were offline. And I'm going to show that to you how I add that in there. Okay? And what I do, uh, anyone not familiar with the local storage? It's basically a key value pair that you can store in the browser. So for me, the key starts with capture at followed by an actual timestamp of when you took the picture. And then I iterate through all of these uh, in that uh, local storage, okay? Then I find all these images, and then I take the Cloudinary API here, 43. So API, cloudinary.com, slash v1, uh, my cloud name, so that's Tomash Demo, image upload, and what I pass in is the actual value from the local storage, which is a... Um, I think it's a, it's a base64 encoded value, okay? So Cloudinary can understand that as well to upload images. It doesn't have to be an actual image file, okay? So uh, I then, if I get a response from Cloudinary, I assume that the upload was successful. I remove that image from the local storage. There's no need to store that. And then I also, these lines update uh, Firebase, right? So I'm updating my database. I'm updating my backend and I say, hello, there's a new entry, okay? And then I navigate back to the slash of my application, which is, which is the root. So how does this look behind the scenes? <clears throat> so I have the Firebase console, where I have set up a project. <clears throat> and if I click on database, what you will see here is a collection called captures. And these are all the images that you have uploaded. So all they have is a public ID and an uploaded timestamp. Okay, so these are all the values 
that get added. So every time when you upload an image, a new entry gets added into this database. And because this new value gets added and because how Firebase works, in real time, it pushes that update out to all the connected devices, which then you can act on as well. So what is this public ID? So that public ID, I'm just trying to put the pieces together for you so that you understand what's happening. So if I log in into my cloud in your account, under my media library, I will have to delete a lot of images now. Uh, I should have put them in a folder, but I didn't. So what you will see is all your pictures appearing here, and the public ID is just a unique reference ID to the picture itself. Okay, so I store this value in the database so that later on I can come to Cloudinary and retrieve the image. Also notice that the images that you see here are the raw images, even though in the app you see the transformed versions of the images, right? You see the little uh, rounded uh, zoom on the face, okay? So public ID in Firebase that references Cloudinary. So far, so good, at least I hope. Does this kind of make sense so far? Okay? Hopefully. So capture component <coughs> uh, has the actual video and the canvas. So what happens here is that you get a video, I get a video feed, that's from the camera. And when you take a picture, that image gets inputted to this canvas element. So that's when, you remember, you took a picture and then you had a still image in place, okay? So this is uh, what achieves that. There's some additional logic in here using, you know, ng-if. Probably there's an equivalent in every other framework. So we say, if the stream is being displayed, do capture photo, and if line 17, if we are not online, and if we are not displaying the stream, meaning that we've just taken a picture, so we're showing that picture and we're offline, then the button says use photo and upload later. So it's just a logic to show the different buttons. Furthermore, in capture component, <coughs> uh, what should I show you? What should I show you? That doesn't matter. You can always check how I got the actual feed from the camera but that's kind of irrelevant now. What's important is the use photo, okay? So use photo is a method that also checks, actually I, I did Navigator online, I probably should have used my service, ignore that. So I check whether I'm online or not. So if I'm not online, meaning that, you know, I don't have an active network connection, I basically call local story set, uh, set item and I store the captured image in local storage as a key value pair where the key is capture at and the time taken and the value is the actual capture which is a data URL of the canvas element image JPEG. So that's line 88, okay? Otherwise, so else, if I'm online, I just call the Cloudinary API, I upload the image. If I get a response from Cloudinary saying upload was okay, then I you remember this capture collection that's in Firebase. I just add the new item to my Firebase database. Because that new item gets added, Firebase pushes that out to all the devices and you see an updated feed. Okay? <clears throat> now what's interesting is the Firebase integration. So Firebase, even though it's an online, real-time, WebSocket-based data store. As you saw, even though when we were offline, it still showed us some data. And so even if you, so I'm using Angular Firestore, which is the Angular Firebase library. I don't know how to explain that. It's like the, if you want to use Firebase with Angular, use Angular Fire. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and if you wouldn't have this enable persistence when you, when you, call, when you actually add the, uh, the Firebase implementation, we wouldn't see the images. That wouldn't work, okay? It's, it is only because I've added this enable persistence that enables us to see the images, to see the data that comes from this online data store even when we are offline, okay? So this is, this is key here. And this enable persistence method is available in Firebase as a whole. So you don't need to use Angular and Angular Fire for that. If you just work with Firebase, then you have 
access to enable persistence regardless of where you are. <coughs> Any questions? So this is a, a massive app, especially if you're not an Angular developer, but hopefully you can still take away some things from this. You can apply this to, to other frameworks. Luckily, I have a link to a very similar app that does this, but uses React. So, yay. <coughs> um, but again, the concept there is exactly, so it, it's not using Firebase there, but the concept is the same. Local storage, navigator online, offline, make sure that you act on the change. If you come online, local storage has something, upload image. You know, same, same stuff, but using uh, React. And as I said, you could use any other framework. <clears throat> so besides this, are there any questions on this? So you have access to both the starter and both the final code, which is this one. Feel free to have a look at this, run it, test it. If there's any questions, then you can just email me, tweet, tweet me, LinkedIn me, whatever, and just ask away. Uh, I'd be more than happy to help. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is Lighthouse, because we didn't talk about Lighthouse itself. So let's take our app. I actually never run the Lighthouse test with, with this app, but it's going to be interesting to see. Um, so as I said, Lighthouse, you can use that as a CLI tool. So you can just npm install Lighthouse and run it locally, or you can run it via DevTools, uh, and it's under audits. Yes, it's under audits. And notice that you get some options here. You can say you want to test on mobile or desktop, so let's do desktop. It can do a lot more, but I'm not interested in the performance nor the best practices. I just want to make sure that you know, I pass the progressive web app test. I'm not going to do throttling, so you can also do throttling for 3G and 2G. Uh, clear storage, yes, so run audit. So I don't know how long this is going to take, or whether this is going to work, but I'm pretty confident that I've added everything uh, in order for this to be a proper PWA. If not, then we'll <laughs> check another example. So what this does, uh, just for those of you not familiar with Lighthouse, uh, it's too slow. It's fine. Um, so what it does, it has certain tests. Okay, so by default, it gives you tests for is it fast and reliable, is it installable, and I, I'm going to scroll through those. Uh, what is important to remember is that this Lighthouse tool is also based on plugins. So you can come up with your own tests. Again, you can submit that to Google, and then they're going to either include it or not. But even if they, they don't include it, you can run Lighthouse locally with your own tests. So ignoring the fact that it's a very slow site, installable, uses HTTPS, PW optimized. So we get a few warnings. Uh, manifest is missing a single icon. We could probably fix that. But we are in a very good state, right? We got a lot of green check marks. OK, so this is. Uh, showing us that, okay, this is a relatively good progressive web application. Okay, so now what you could do, of course, you could take a look at this. Why is it loading too slow? Add that icon, and then you would get an even better result. <clears throat> now, on all the uh, versions of Chrome, I don't know if you guys do auto updates or not, you may get a different view. They used to have like a score of 100, and, and it would say you scored 86 out of 100 for your PWA. So if you see that, that's an older version of, of uh, Lighthouse. But feel free to have a look at this. We also have, this is still running, so we can do a local audit uh, for this. This uses images, so no performance, no best practices. So let's see how this one is going to do. Oh, I stopped that, yeah. Bare minimum, so for when, when is it uh, an actual PWA? Because um, it's not fast and reliable, you can still, it's still a working PWA, right? So. So they specify certain thresholds. Like for example, now you see I got red warnings everywhere because it only uses HTTPS. Nothing else, you know, there's no manifest file. It's not optimized. There's no viewport tag. So all of these things, if you add all of these, then they say it's a proper PWA. 
So what I'm going to do, I'll try to find this site real quick, run it, and then rerun the test and see if we can uh, get some better results. <clears throat> I wish I could know what that example was. Uh, No. Okay, so node server.js 8181. Go away. <coughs> Audit uh, plus. Oh, okay, so run this audit. <coughs> so I think this one has most of the things that it are required. Okay, so uh, start URL doesn't respond. Okay, so there's still some things that I would, obviously there's no HTTPS, there's no splash, okay, so there's probably more than I, I thought that we would need to fix, but at least it gives you a, a good sense of knowing what you're missing, you fix them, and then you're going to be ready to, ready to roll with your PWA. <coughs> Let me also try one more thing, because now I think this little thing works. Okay, so view. Yay, okay, so what I will try to do is redirect 8081 to localhost 8081. I want to show you the add to home screen thing. Hopefully that's going to <coughs> pop up. So what is it? 8081. Still doesn't show. Anyway, I, I give up. Sorry. There should be a, a little pop-up sort of towards the bottom of the screen to say add to home screen, but it's fine. Okay. So last few slides. Um, <clears throat> so these are all links to articles. Some are uh, kind of older, but th these are all related to the last three are, are, are very fresh. So I don't know when that happened. I probably should look that up, but you know in Google Play, traditionally speaking, when you looked for an app, it was an Android Kotlin something app, right? But Google has changed that, so they now allow you to submit progressive web apps, and people just can search for that, download it from there, and it will, you, know, you wouldn't know the difference whether you have a proper app or a progressive web app. Uh, the same is true for Microsoft Store, uh, and as you saw, Microsoft Edge automatically detects these PWAs as well, so I showed that to you uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, iOS 13, so obviously Apple uh, recently had this, uh, how do they call it, the WWDC something conference uh, where they announced iOS 13. What they didn't announce is that they will have a lot of improved PWA support as well. Uh, this is a link to an article that discusses those changes. And on Google I.O. Uh, about what, a month ago, two months ago, uh, Google said that they now support, so if you have a, what do they call it, Chromebook, Pixelbook, that runs a Chrome OS, PWAs are automatically going to be supported there, so that means that you can install an app, it's going to be added to your launch bar, and it's going to act as a standard uh, application. So these are links, uh, some are to tweets, some are to YouTube uh, videos, some are to articles that you can take a look at. Additional resources, uh, so I created a PWA handbook, which I will now update because there's some updates that needs to go in there. But if you are new to the PWA stuff, that handbook walks you through of putting together that news application, the first one, the very ugly one, okay? And it walks you through the basics of the service API, how to use the cache, and it shows you the code samples. And the end result should be that you have a fully functioning 
very simple but fully functioning progressive web app. Uh, these two links are two blog posts that go into the detail of this adaptive image loading that we kind of discussed using the network information API and stuff uh, without Workbox and with Workbox. And then this is the React stuff that I mentioned. So that is a similar application, uh, which basically is a camera app. It allows you to take a picture. Uh, and if you're offline, it stores it in local storage. When you go online, it uploads it to Cloudinary, written in React. Are there any questions about anything that we have discussed this afternoon? You will, I don't know, the slides are going to be distributed, right, at yeah. some point. I'm asking the, the organizers, but <clears throat> one is hiding behind the column. <laughs> uh, do you know if the slides are going to be distributed? Probably they will, and then they have to be, okay? I, I'll make sure, maybe I will tweet about this as well. What this design change also removed is all my Twitter handles, but I'll, I'll put them back in just a second. Uh, I'll make sure that you get this, and I will update this with the GitHub links as well, so you have access to those as well. Sorry, any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm really wondering, uh, how does this compare, uh, in your opinion, uh, to if, if, for like if, if you want to make a, like a mobile application, how does this compare to, if you want to make a mobile application using web te technology, I mean, how does this compare to like using something like Cordova or using React Native or other technologies that are, that are out there? <coughs> and do you think this will take over? Do you think this will be the, the way to do it, basically? So one obvious difference, and in that Google I.O. talk, I think the, the Google team gave away an answer to your question. They basically showcased uh, sketch, which is like this design app, and they showed three screenshots. One was a PWA, one was working on a Mac, and one was working on an iPad of some sort of something. And the key, what they said there was that it's the same code base. It was exactly the same code base running on three different, completely separate devices. One in an app, one in a browser, and I think that's the key, right? So. <clears throat> Think about this, this selfie thing that we did, right? So let's say you, you have this Angular app, and now you want to have a mobile version of that. So you, now you would have to you know, recreate this entire new project using one of these technologies like Cordova or Ionic or whatever. With this, you just say, OK, ng add Angular PWA, and you continue to work on the same code base with minimal mod modifications, and you will end up having the same result, essentially. But same, like what about the downside? <coughs> okay. So Performance-wise, is it better to use React Native, for example? Or uh, that, that depends. That depends. Okay. Uh, if you, again, I'm just going to reference Google material here. Uh, they have a lot of uh, use cases and showcases and comparisons with regarding to performance and user retention, and they give you all the percentages and all the dollar values that you ever wanted. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, what do I want to say? The other thing, that was another thing. Uh, no, it's about the, um, what was your question again? Say the question again. Let's just replay the conversation. Maybe I, was I remember. Just wondering what are the downsides? Like, you explained to me that like, uh, the plus side from using a Downs I have it, I have it, sorry. Um, obviously, there are some things that you can't access from the browser that you would be able to access from uh, a native mobile app, right? Um, I, I want to say an example. You can use the camera. You can't use, so for your fingerprint readers, right? You can, you, there, there is now a, I don't know what state that is in at the moment, but there's this web authentication thing that has a fingerprint API, which, is, which means that the browsers would be able to read that as well, but it's in progress. Okay, so there's lots of things. Again, if you check that Google I.O. talk, they have this nice uh, uh, sort of timeline. They will also support, I think that's, although that's relevant to the Pixel book, the, the, their progressive web apps, if you run it on a Chromebook or Pixel book, they will give you native file uh, system support. Plus, they will have special extensions that you double click and they will open in progressive web apps. So they make a lot of effort to making progressive web apps come up to par with uh, native mobile apps. So there are some things that you can't do, 
but as the web progresses, there's going to be a lot more that you can do. And, and that's when there's not going to be a difference between a traditional app and a, pro, and a web based progressive uh, oh, app. So that's the issue that Apple's not allowing, uh, or maybe they are now, I mean, I'm not sure, the progressive. It, it always going to, yeah, it's always going to depend on the vendor support. So whether Apple is going to ever add the web authentication API with the fingerprints to Safari, big question mark. No one knows. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. You know, but then you, know, you may have just a news app that you want to do that doesn't need a fingerprint reader, right? So it's, it's always going to be dependent on, on what your use case is. <coughs> You're welcome. OK. So there's a thank you slide, but I'm going to go back to the very, very first one. That's where you find my Twitter handle that's right there. It was, as I said, removed from the, um, when I changed the slides, doesn't matter. So feel free to contact me there if you have any questions. As I said, if you have questions about uh, becoming a developer expert, let me know. If you have questions about Cloudinary, let me know. Before I forget, I brought you stickers, lots of stickers. I don't know if someone was already saw this on Twitter. I have, oopsie, uh, cool cat. Okay, it's a cat wearing a hat. It's, these are all Cloudinary stickers, by the way. And I have dubbing unicorns. Ooh. That's the one that people want. I know that's the people that people want. Okay, so I'm going to open this. Feel free to take all of them, because my bag was full of this. Um, so yeah, any questions about anything, tweet me. And thank you very much for your attention today. <laughs>